And this is Joe Kelly Radio. We're here as we are going to introduce one of our great friends. We've known him for a couple decades now, I believe. And uh, he's originally from <laughs> he's originally from New York. Uh, I met him. Well, I might have met him after he left Minnesota, but uh, he's been making home for quite a while in Berlin, Germany, as a member of the Blue Man Group. And he's out in Berlin, Germany now. And uh, we're welcome. David Anania, Dave Anania, back on Joe Kelly Radio. How you doing, brother? What'd you say, Joe? I couldn't quite get that. <laughs> I'm fine, man. It's a pleasure to, to you sure? be back. On. Wait, wait. <laughs> Just, is, is that ringing in my ears, bothering you? Um, no, no, no. <laughs> No, I, it's 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 really it's a pleasure to, to to hear your voice again. It's been, it's been a long time, and yeah, you know, it's it's always just easy peasy and a pleasure to be here with you on your show. So thanks for having me back. Yeah, and um, of course, the main top not the main topic, but one of the big topics we were talking a little before we got into um, the interview, talking about basically the music business shutting down and now trying to grind the wheels to figure out a way how to make it happen again. Um, back in March or something, how, when was your last show with the Blue Man Group? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I played my last show probably around like the 10th of March, I think, okay. or so. And then there was a, you know, a full company meeting on that, on the Friday of that week, I guess it was, it was, a, I literally, I think it was actually Friday the 13th, to be honest with you. Um, and the decision had been made that, you know, it, the, it had gotten to a point where they were going to actually <laughs> temporarily right. shut down and, and, you know, until further notice, we would not be, we would not be doing shows. And the, the really messed up part about it is, is, I, I'm pretty, it was our, it would have been our, oh, I think it would, would have been our sixth, 6,000th sixth show in, wow. in, in Berlin or, or at the, the, the theater we moved into in Berlin. We had been there. I mean, we've been in Berlin for, I guess, almost 17 years now, but we, the first like three years we were in this huge, 1700 seater and then we kind of had a more intimate theater um offered for us to continue our run which is way better for the show and that, that was in like early 2007 so i think it was the six thousandth show or fifth thousandth i can't remember and it was like right. we literally ended one show before that you know, that milestone <laughs> milestone so uh, but that was it it was it was the second week of march of 2020 was the last show performed. Now, in the music business, everybody sees the glamour, like, you know, on stage, all the excitement and the, the thrills you'd give us. If a job's lost, like us, if you're in nine to five or whatever, you know, you can get unemployment and stuff like that. How about musicians? Is it any, any, any better or is it kind of fend for yourself? Well, but that, that's the thing. <sighs> For the most part, I mean, e even like if you have a touring gig, like, you know, with a major label act, um, you know, unless, I mean, okay, Prince would have his band on retainer. So they were, you know, they were taken care of even when they were not on tour, but then they were also, you know, at his beck and call if he wanted to have them out at the studio at two in the morning or something, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, right. It's it's a it's an individual case based on who the employer is, and for the most part, you know, musicians are self-employed. Right, so, right. and you know, I'm I'm extremely lucky um, uh, on on two levels. The, the first level is Blue Man Group is it's actually we are. Um, we are a, a Cirque du Soleil production. So okay. a few a few years ago, Blue Man Group sold the show to Cirque du Soleil. So that's one part of the puzzle. But the show here in Berlin um, was licensed to 
a company called Stage Entertainment. And they, you know, they basically, they put up Broadway shows all over Europe. They've got theaters that they own. And so, you know, they'll do Mamma Mia and they'll put it up in, in Stuttgart or, you know, um, Beauty and the Beast. And they'll do that in Hamburg or in, in stuff like that. And so they bought the licensing to have us perform Blue Man Group. So we are technically, even though we are a Cirque du Soleil show, we are kind of temporarily owned by Stage Entertainment, okay. which means... <laughs> which means that, you know, sadly, Cirque du Soleil um, filed for insolvency last year and like immediately all of their touring productions closed, all of the Blue Man shows in the States closed and they all, you know, it's like clean out your locker your health insurance is gone. Uh, um, it, it was, it was heavy, super heavy, right. you know, but for us over here, and the way that the system is set up here in Germany, because we are licensed through stage entertainment, we weren't directly affected by that because our license agreement lasts through the end of July of this year. And okay. because it's kind of different over here, um, we're on, we all have contracts. Like all of the, the normal cast members have contracts. Like the band is, we're all halftime. So it's, you know, we're not making full-time salary or anything, right. but because of the circumstances of the pandemic, we are actually still receiving a percentage of income um, because we are actually contracted, which okay. is, which is really like, I give thanks every day for that because I like a lot of musicians was, you know, no one was expecting this and especially that it would last this long, you know, yeah. and, yeah, yeah. but a lot of my friends here and obviously a lot of my friends in the States don't have, don't have that luxury. And like, they're really like a hundred percent self-employed. And so, you know, they've had to apply for support from the government, which is cool, except you also have to pay taxes and, yeah. you know, but, However, the system over here in Germany, I, I will say it's just, it's much kinder than right. what's been going on in the States. I will, I will say that. But so, like I said, it's, it's really an individual case. Um, so a bit of good news is that someone invested in Cirque du Soleil and is bringing it back to life. So that's very good news. Oh, okay. That, that's good. And yeah, it's very good. And I mean, Blue Man Group as a show isn't very... Um, like the running costs aren't very high because the cast isn't huge and it's not an orchestra and the dancers and the chorus and the leads, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a very compact production. So I, I would be surprised if they wouldn't want to revive the shows uh, just due to the fact that I, I feel like there's, you know, it's guaranteed success once people feel comfortable going back to seeing live entertainment so my my fingers are crossed for my friends in the states yeah dave anania is with us always upbeat and uh member of the blue man group and also member uh, drummer for greasy meal out in minneapolis they still uh connect with each other every every few years play drums with shannon kerfman and uh just a big part of the minneapolis new york music sing international drummer you know he released a few years ago Great CD. We've been featuring tracks here on uh, Joe Kelly Radio. Ananiya, reinvent the feel. And before we talk about the music in this, the uh, the art presentation on the CD. I love the liner notes you got in here too. You went Thank in pretty. You. you didn't. You didn't. You didn't cheat on this. And and my favorite thing <laughs> that somewhere I I don't know if it was in an interview you did or or in the liner notes you said I hired some of my friends to play on instruments that I'm not as good at like guitar and strings and horns. I remember reading yeah. that somewhere. Yeah. 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 I'm, you know, uh, my gratitude is, is boundless for these people because I mean, I'm, I'm lucky with my education. I really got into orchestrating and arranging and I grew up listening to a lot of prog rock and, and like just kind of like these thick arrangements and harmonies and stuff. So, it was natural for me 
to include that in the songwriting. But, you know, if I tried to play a violin, it would sound like somebody was like choking a small sheep and it's just, you know, it just would not be a good idea. <laughs> but, so I'm, you know, not, not only on the string instruments and the horn instruments, but, you know, I can get my way around a synthesizer. So like synth bass and some keyboard stuff is great, but I had some world-class musicians play on that record who I'm always um, indebted to. And I'll, I'll play on the record for free. <laughs> yeah, you, you guys, <laughs> just do your guys from uh, Greasy Meal all over this record with you as well. Yeah, um, yeah. And they, so, Spicy T's on it too, right? He is, yes. He, yeah. he made up a rap. He made up That's a rap why, about yeah. it. Right. I, I, I blush every time I hear it. <laughs> But it, 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 it's, it's, that's on Reinvent the Field, right? What's that? That's on Reinvent the Field, the track. It, exactly, yeah. He rapped on that, and uh, John Fields played, um, he played slap bass on that, and second guitar, and then Kevin Gastongue, who plays keyboards with Corey Wong, played Hammond organ on that track. It's just, wow. Oof, it's, it's painful hey. how good they are. Now, you guys are all, all great at what you, you do, your craft, and... Um, now, now, we all know you as a drummer. We may have talked about this before, but becoming a lead singer and everything like that, is it a difficult transition for you? Or was it when you started? Um, I, I don't know. I haven't tried it yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, here, here's the thing. It's like, I, uh, you know, I was always singing in like, you know, a high school choir and, and um, you know, the high school, you know, the, the, I had a rock cover band called like Fox Rocks, you know, like three X's right. and all that kind of stuff. And so I was, I was, you know, I was doing some singing in, in, you know, as I was growing up um, and some background stuff when I started, you know, kind of gigging around Minneapolis, but you know, my, my biggest influence on me as an overall musician was Phil Collins. So right. it's, it's like, just kind of having him is sort of that not a, I guess, kind of a mentor in a way, even though he, you know, he doesn't know. Well, he does know, actually he does know, but yeah. so having him as a role model in a way, it just sort of was a natural transition. Um, you know, I still feel like it's something I could definitely continue to improve on, but I also, uh, yeah, it's um, some, somehow I feel like, uh, it, it makes sense for me to, I could have maybe asked other people to sing these songs, but it, you know, the, they're, they're personal. So I sort of felt like, well, I guess I should probably do it. And uh, it, it turned out okay. Yeah. And one of my favorite tracks on the record ever and ever the, do a great vocals uh, on that. So, yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That, the slow, slow jam. Yeah. Thank you. That's, yeah. That's that's one of the most heavily orchestrated track. That's kind of like it's got this outro that's kind of like Chicago esque horn section kind of stuff, and that's mm -hmm. it's um it's one of my favorites. Thank you. I'm glad you like that. Yeah. Now Phil Collins, of course, you've mentioned before on previous talks how big of an influence you you were able to meet him. It was in New York, right? He came to one of your shows, at the Blue Man Group. <laughs> yeah, it was, the, yeah. it was the weirdest weirdest experience ever. Um, the press and marketing director for our show in New York at the Astor Place Theater came out to me. And this was literally like a, a less than a month before I moved to Berlin too. And uh, she came up to me it was after a show or something. She said, so you, you know, he's watching the show on Wednesday, right? I was like, no. She's like, mm. Phil, Phil Collins. I was like, what? And so we had this, you know, <laughs> this, this, this whiteboard in the hallway down you know, backstage downstairs in the theater and with the schedule for the week. And I, I, I never run faster in my life than to get to that board to see who was scheduled to play the show on that, on that night. And unbelievable. It's like, literally, if there's like, if you believe in anything like the law of attraction or fate or whatever, that's right. it. It's Cause I was on the schedule for both shows, which I, it was perfect. And I'm so glad because I, I can't, Imagine that either of the other two guys, the other two drummers who I shared the schedule with, you know, and I was just a sub at that time. I played like three shows a week. So the chances to be, you know, in that night were, were pretty slim anyway. But 
if I would have been like, hey, do you mind switching shows so I can play on Wednesday because <laughs> Phil Collins is going to be in the audience? It's like, I, would, I don't know if I would have gotten a, like a rousing sure. You know, well, you, had so mon- I, you had money ready in case you had to pay somebody, right? Yeah, yeah, not a lot, yeah. but it was, you know, I, I guess it, you know, with inflation back then, it was, it would have been enough. Right, right. But um, yeah, it was, it was, un, it was the highlight of my career. And I've had incredible moments, but, you know, I will always go back to that because it was because of him, his drumming and singing that I really committed to being a, a musician, you know, and to see, <laughs> to get ready for the show, like we've got this kind of scrim where we can see the audience, but they can't see us until the lights come on. So okay. I, you know, I went, up, I went up to get ready for the start of the show and I looked out and I saw the guy who I, you, you, um, I'm normally in, in the audience watching him. Mm-hmm. He's mm-hmm. in the audience and he's about to watch me do what he inspired me to do. And it was, it was, really it was pretty nerve-wracking at first but then you know once i hit the first downbeat it was like okay it was you know the nerves went away yeah so did you meet him no go ahead oh no no that that go with your question that that would have been no did you meet did you i know there's a picture up on your pages um did you do you meet him beforehand or after the show um thank god i met him after okay (laughs) I i think so and and you know and it was we always do a meet and greet after the show where, you know, the audience comes out, you know, through in the lobby and we're there and they can take pictures with the blue men and with the band stuff. So, you know, it, it was just kind of our normal after show thing. And then, you know, everybody was gone and I knew that he was still in the house. And then, you know, they, they brought him through and, and he, we talked for you know, about 10, 15 minutes. And I was, I managed to really just be authentic with him and not super like, you know, what kind of sticks do you use? You know, you know that, you know, the whole thing that really, if, you, yeah. if, you're, if you're nervous, you can, you can make, you can make or break that moment, you know? Right. And, and I felt super comfortable telling him exactly how important he was to me. And, you know, the record that I heard that was that moment and why, and, you know, and he thanked me and he gave me a huge hug and, you know, I gave him my, my card and he emailed me a couple of days later and was like, the show was fantastic. It was great. And then I moved to Berlin and, and he was just starting on his, his first final farewell tour. And um, so I ended up getting to get a couple of tickets to go see him when he came through Berlin a few months later. And it was really, you know, he's, he was just super, super kind to me. And you know, I, I also know of horror stories when people meet celebrities who had a huge impact on what they do as right. an artist, you know, and then it's just kind of like, oh, I, you know, I can imagine how heartbreaking that is. But, but, but Phil was down to earth. He was super engaging and comfortable. And, you know, I, obviously I would have loved to have spent more time talking to him, but the, I will always be grateful that I was even not only able to talk with him and just be in the moment about that, but also to really just show it's kind of the best way to show somebody how important they are to you. If you, if you can show them the art that you create because of their influence in a way, and not many, like at my level, not many people got that chance, you know? Yeah. That, so, that's like a dream story for, for, for it was you. Huge. Yeah, it was super. Yeah. It was, it was amazing. Uh, my guest is a great friend of ours, David Anania. And uh, Anania is the CD, Reinvent the Feel, A-N-A-N-I-A. Where, where are the best spots for people to get the CD or download tracks? Where can people get the CD? Yeah, or download tracks, whatever, whatever how you're selling it. Well, I mean, you can get bootlegs on Napster. Oh, okay. <laughs> Actually, it, it, it is available. It is available on Napster. Um, I mean, yeah, it's available for sale, which, of yeah. course, especially especially in the trying times that we're all experiencing as artists, that would be wonderful if people would be interested in, in contributing to, you know, me 
continuing to do what I love to do. And it's available for sale. I mean, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon CD, or um, it can be ordered directly through me at, oh boy, I got to look it up. Like, I think it's paypal.me slash, I'm, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. My computer's too slow. Hold on. Oh, okay. Okay. So, um, yes, it is paypal.me slash, um, what, what's the thing, the angular, what do you call that? I'm so used uh, to German. Backslash? It's slash. Yeah, it's like slash. Like the, sla the, the angular slash thingy, right? Right, yep. Okay, okay good. And then, so it's paypal.me slash Mama Mia Music, Mama with one, with one M, like, well, okay, Mama, the M-A-M-A-M-I-A-M-U-S-I-C, -A 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 all one word. Okay. Going and back to your Italian roots, right? Hey, Mamma Mia, it's on the knee, right? Huh? <laughs> right, there you go. Dave on the knee is with us right now, and, uh, you know, it was a big part of the Minneapolis music scene when he was living uh, out there. And uh, maybe we'll you refresh our listeners' memories about when you first moved out there and then, you know, all, all the great connections and, and you made with a lot of great musicians out there. When, when did you move out there originally? Okay. The, the short, long story is, is um, my mother is from a small town in Wisconsin that's like a five-hour drive east of Minneapolis. The town's called Oshkosh, which okay. for all of us in, all, in America, it's Oshkosh Bagosh, like these overalls. That's literally, you know, that's right. where they're from. So um, even though I was born and, and raised just outside of New York City, when I was about 12, my mom and I moved out to Oshkosh. And so I, you know, went through middle school and high school there. And then my freshman year of college, um, I, did, I chose to go to University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, which is, I mean, that's where like uh, um, Justin Vernon, Bon Iver is from. And it's, it, at that time, it was a really pretty happening jazz school, uh, jazz studies program there. So I went there for my freshman year. And, and that, the summer after that year, I got my first pro gig playing at a, an amusement park outside of Minneapolis called Valley Fair. And um, during that summer, like I was 19, so you know, I couldn't get into bars or anything. But at one point, like that summer, somebody was like, you, you got to go hear Dr. Mamo's combo with this, this drummer. His name's Michael Bland. He's unbelievable. You know, and Prince just, you know, he just started playing with Prince. So I was like, OK, but I couldn't, mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't get into bars. So one day they played an all ages outdoor show in this area called St. Anthony, Maine, right around the Mississippi, which had some cool clubs at the time. And, you know, it was, it was a pretty happening area. And so they did an outdoor gig and I went and I think they opened up with their cover version of Proud Mary, which if okay. anybody's ever heard that, it's, it's what a cover really should be. It's like they took the song and it's, unbelievable but it's also so different from the original that right. it's it's like but but what i heard was this this fill which then michael later um played on in the midsection of diamonds and pearls and if anybody knows drumming they they know and michael they know the 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 fill i'm talking about and it was it was like the way that he played that fill and how it sounded and his pocket and his time. And it was like, you know, it was like nothing I had ever heard in person before. You know, I, I, you know, I, I love the influences I've had, like Phil, Phil Collins will always be my biggest influence. David Garibaldi, Tower of Power, right. Menno Cache, Peter Gabriel and, and Sting, Joni Mitchell, um, you know, John Bonham, whatever. But then I heard Michael play and it was like nothing I'd ever heard before, like just the confidence and the power and the funk. And I didn't, I didn't know how it was going to happen, but something inside me clicked and I'm like, okay, wherever I thought I would probably live after college, it's going to be Minneapolis. Wow. And, 
And so that was, that was the turning point for me. And, you know, I kind of slid around through a couple of different universities and left school for a while to play in a cover band in Minneapolis and the whole thing. And, but then finally, like, I guess, I guess it was 91 or so. Right. Um, I, I just chose to, to leave school where I was and move to Minneapolis. And like, if I'm going to finish college, it's going to be there and that's it. And so from there on out, it was like, I was, you know, by then I was legal. I could drink. Well, I could get right. in the bar, sorry. And, <laughs> you know, and, and drink if I wanted to. Right. Um, and, you know, I just made a post about this, if, uh, or at least a, a comment on Facebook a few weeks ago. Like this, this cover band, this Dr. Mamo's Combo that Michael was playing in when Prince kind of took him, was playing at this infamous club called Bunkers. And they had a house gig where they were playing every Monday and Tuesday. And it was a $3 cover. And for me, like what I wrote in the comment, it was like, I basically paid $6 a week for like a two and a half hour. Well, no, like, okay, let's say five or six hour drum lesson from Michael Bland and like getting like, like just getting schooled by all of those incredible players on the stage in that, that right. band, like you could learn everything from everybody. And so that was like, you know, if I ever questioned if it was a good move for me to choose Minneapolis over Nashville, New York, LA, Austin, whatever. It was like, it was, it, there was no doubt, you know? And, and so I would just go there and I would listen to Michael every week and it was uh, really, it was just mind blowing what he was doing and how, what he was creating. And, you know, we became friends over the years and I ended up playing in a group with the um, sadly passed away, um, Doug Nelson, an incredible, uh, Doug Nelson, an incredible bass player who was with Mambo's Combo and also with Johnny Lang for a while. And I, I was playing in a, a a gig with with Doug and he really liked my playing and so when Michael was going out on tour at one point they called me and asked if I wanted to sub for him in Dr. Mambo's Combo and um, you know they liked it enough so that I ended up being his his first call sub and oh wow yeah I didn't, so didn't know was, that yeah and so that was like that was the you know, that was getting thrown into the lion's den. <laughs> so you were, Whenever you were my, playing with Sonny T? No, Sonny T was on tour. So, Well, no, I, it, it, you know, it, as time went on, yes, because, you know, sadly, Doug passed away. And, right. you know, so I, luckily, like, you know, like I said, Minneapolis has some of the, you know, it's, it's top tier musicianship, like, like rows and rows and rows of it. So you, it's, it's so fertile with just creativity and like musicality, not, not just like technical, like, wow, that guy is really good at that. It's like, they're all, there's an attitude within the Minneapolis sound that is so authentic and so about a feel as well. You know what I mean? Right. And, and so I was kind of thrown into that and, and I was at a place in my ability and, and in, at an age where I was like, yeah, cool, let's do it. And maybe it was horrible. I mean, I guess it was never horrible because they kept asking me back. Right. But, you know, to, to be on stage with those guys and, you know, I learned their arrangements by being there so often. Like, I, you know, I never rehearsed. I just kind of went and played the gig, but I knew all the hits and I knew all the, you know, the endings and the whole thing. So it was easy for them too, in a way. So it was, you know, through, through Dr. Mambo's combo and getting my ass kicked regularly by incredible musicians that I found my way into Greasy Meal. And Which was just a phenomenon out there, right? You guys just... Yeah, it was... Had such, it, such a following. It, it, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it was, hap it was already happening when I, I joined the band. Like, I, I joined the band probably about a year after they started playing. Um, okay. cause their original drummer, Dorian Crozier, who was unbelievable, um, moved to LA because he was started playing with the Rembrandts. It was oh, also, okay. yeah. Yeah. Phil, Phil Solom is one half of the Rembrandts. 
he's also from Minneapolis. So it's, there, there was a lot going on at a bunch of different styles in that town, which is amazing. Um, but so, yeah, I started playing with them in Jan, uh, January of two, oh, sorry, of 96. And that was kind of, that was it. And it was, you know, within a few months, we were like packing the caboose every Sunday. It's like, let's make an album. So we made a bunch of them. And it was with, you know, Tommy Barbarella on keys and Jim Anton on bass, um, John Strawberry Fields on guitar, who was also our producer and engineer. And, you know, of course, you know, uh, Julius Collins on vocals, Ken Chastain on percussion and vocals, Tom Scott, you know, Spicy T on, you know, uh, second keyboards, you know, samples, raps. And sadly, um, you know, the, the, the band was formed around Brian Gallagher, who was the sax player right. in the NPG. And that was actually, you know, why Greasy Meal was formed originally. Um, and so, but yeah, he was, he was, he's the reason that band even existed in the first place. Uh, he passed away way, way too early. Yeah. 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 It was, that, it was that horrible year in 2016. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, I, I, we had that band for a solid four years. And then also like, you know, the off offspring, like the jazz project with, with Jim Anton on bass and Tommy Barbarella and Brian on sax and myself. Mm -hmm. And that was, it was a great outlet for us. And it's just, it was a magical collective to be a part of and just like geniuses all over the place. <laughs> it was, yeah. you know, well, well then, I almost went to the university of Minnesota. I was accepted there to go there in 85. I was going to transfer. I went out there, but I wound up going to temple in Philadelphia, but yeah, it would, oh. have, it would have been something out there. Well, you would have been in Minneapolis in the 80s? <sighs> yeah, 80, 85. I went out there. And me and my brother, we went out there. We flew out there. And we had relatives, cousins, which we never knew we had. We stayed at their house, went to First Ave. But the school actually was closed on holidays, so we never were able to tour the campus. And I was only um, going out there for the music scene, to be honest. Yeah, I mean... In they also, I mean, they had, they had a, a solid music program there when I was there. And so it just, it made sense if I really wanted to actually get a degree that, you know, my gigging around town coincided with finishing up my degree there. So, okay, uh, yeah. Hey, how about, let me ask you this as a musician, Prince and his music, what do you think the mindset, would you guess Prince bringing in drummers like Michael Bland and John Blackwell to play on the tracks instead of him playing the tracks. What, what do you, how do you think he thought in his mind in certain songs? You got any comment on that? I mean, like it, this is just like an educated guess. Okay. Um, not, not having been a part of, of that camp, you know, intimately, you know what I mean? Like I played with right. a bunch of the guys in his band, like, Prince, Prince was basically like he's from, he was from another planet. You know what I mean? He, he literally yeah. created, he created a sound that is associated with a city and it's a style of music and it's this unbelievable meshing of styles. And, you know, also Claire Fisher's string arrangements is, it's, he's, you know, it's, he's out of this world, but he also, I sort of feel like he loves, like he loves amazing musicians, mm -hmm. you know? And the thing is, is like Prince, Prince was just super, super, super funky. And, you know, I mean, he, you know, his stuff on his, on his earlier records, I mean, like, you know, I want to be your lover or you know, all that stuff where it's, you know, it's, he's drumming. And then right. there's also right. like, you know, I, I think he, he plays on tambourine, right? I think he's yeah, I think he does, too. right? And yeah. so, so I mean, he, he's messing around there, you know. He's 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 pulling some some tricks out of his hat, right? Um, and it's super raw and it's super funky, like in a, it's you know, it's it's somehow it's like oh, this was just one take and that was it was the moment and it captured that, 
But I, I also, I also feel like, even though he was so dynamic and and capable, like he also loved what he could get, like experience with musicians who came from other backgrounds or like had even more of a command of a certain instrument, even though he could play so many instruments, you know, like no one plays, no one makes a drum kit sound like Michael Bland. You know what I mean? So I sort of feel like, you know, he has respect. That's, and he he had this persona where it was kind of like, you know, he's sort of mystical and kind of his own thing and whatever. But, you know, I also feel like, if he didn't love what these other craftsmen or, you know, like, okay, Sheila E or, um, or um, Hannah, Hannah oh, Wel- Welton. Uh, yeah. Hannah Welton. Yeah. 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 Like, you know, or, or, or uh, Rhonda or, you know, uh, all of these, you know, it doesn't matter gender, you know, it's gender doesn't matter, but they all brought something to the table and, and he, he, I think he learned from that also. And he, at the very least, he wanted it because he didn't have to take it, but he wanted it. He felt like it made whatever he was doing better. Yeah. You know? just, just the godfather of the Minneapolis sound, I guess. Yeah. 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 That, that was Prince. Exactly. Yeah. So my guest right now, David Anania, he's a member of the Blue Man Group, Minneapolis Scene Maven played out there for a long time. Still keeps in contact with the Greasy Meal Buddies, right? Yeah, uh, actually, I had a I had a chat with John Fields a few hours ago. So, yeah, I, I, I talk with him every once in a while. I, you know, when Jim was on tour with Johnny Lang, every time they play Berlin or maybe even Hamburg, it's a couple of hours away, and then I would I would make sure I went and checked them out. Um, I mean, the last time I was back in Minneapolis, that was the end of December. Like it was it was the holiday, Christmas holidays of 2019. Oh, and okay. Yeah, I went back for a visit, and we we were all in the studio again, which was really fun. Um, and you know, we 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 laid some stuff down. I mean, we're we're you know, it, we'll see we'll see how how it takes shape and whether it's something that will end up being like, Hey, we did this or, or not, yeah. but yeah. it was still, it was like, it was, it was interesting to be back in the room making music. It was the first time after Brian passed away that we did that. Wow. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot of mixed emotions about that, you know, out of respect for Brian and because the band was basically created around him you know, and he was also such a, a prominent songwriter, you know, it's, you know, and, and he had, you know, a lot of us were very close to him. So it's, do you, how do we, how do we navigate, like, what, you know, how do we do that? How do we feel comfortable? Is it okay that we're doing this? Or is it, you know, somehow disrespectful? But I, I don't think it, I don't think it is. I think without you know, I'm getting, no, I'm going to get super cliche. It's like, I, th- I think it's literally what Brian would have wanted. Right. Right. You know, so who, play, who, so, who was playing sax in the music? Uh, we, we, we didn't have any wind, wind instruments on that session. It was, it was just oh, everybody, okay. you know, yeah, it was, it was the, the remaining, I guess, how many of us are going to We had a huge band. It's right. It's way too big, but well, we, yeah. we met while, uh, you were on tour with Shannon Kerfman yes. up in uh, New Haven, Connecticut at Toads and at South Street Seaport. Yes. Um, you guys, that was, that was a great band there. How, how'd you get involved with Shannon? <laughs> um, because Shannon is, uh, Shannon is another, you know, one of these unique forces in nature where she just, from a very young age, it was less like, she is music, you know, eat, sleeps and breathes music and before i mean okay (laughs) before we started touring with her you know i mean that was she was 14 when we did this tour right but you know the year or two before that 
her, you know, she's from the Fargo area. So her mother would drive her down to Minneapolis consistently. I don't know if it was every weekend, but, you know, she, she with her mom as a guardian, she was somebody we, we'd see regularly at Greasy Meal Gigs or also at Bunkers. So, you know, she just was soaking up the whole music scene of Minneapolis in, you know, the mid mid to late nineties. And, uh, you know, she loved, you know, she loved Greasy. And then, you know, when the band kind of, I mean, we kind of broke up or went on hiatus that made myself and Jim Anton, the bassist available. And she was about to like really start uh, her first tour after getting signed to Arista records. Right. So as soon as she knew that we could be a part of her band, then she wanted to make that happen. So it was, um, you know, and I, I had played some percussion on her first record, like the loud guitars, big suspicions record. Right, so, right. We, you know, I was involved a little bit anyway, but you know, she, she wanted Jim and she wanted me. And our first gig was Good Morning America. <laughs> oh, I remember. I think I got that on videotape. Well, it's probably on YouTube all over the place. But yeah. I, you know what? If, if you have that and there's any way to digitize it, because I've yeah. been looking for that forever. And I, I, can't got, I, I can't promise you anytime soon because when we move everything in boxes down, downstairs. But if I find that, I, I definitely would would send it along to you. Yeah, because it's literally yeah. it's like like there, you that were was playing like, inside, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it. yeah. It was it was the day before Thanksgiving on on you know November whatever in nineteen ninety nine. Okay, that was, and that was our that was our first like our f- first live performance was on that, and it you know. We had done some cool stuff with Greasy and some more regional TV like Chicago and Minneapolis, but like that was one of those moments where I was like, "Oh, this really has to be very good." <laughs> you know, yeah, I was in, in that concert. I was at South Streets. I was standing right next to Clive Davis. He he was digging it. Well, that was one of his artists at the time. Yeah, I mean. The thing about the thing about that tour for me is like it was it was really it was eye opening on on a few levels. Um, Mm -hmm. Like we did so much cool stuff on that tour. I mean, it lasted. I I guess if you want to say that was our first show and then it lasted from November, like late November of 99 through mid September of 2000. Okay. And like, you know, in that time, like after we did the great, uh, the Good Morning America gig, um, we had, I don't know, a couple of weeks or something. And then we all flew down to Florida for rehearsals for um, opening up for John Mellencamp. So wow. you and know, that was so her we first were, record, right? Yeah, that was her. That was her debut record. Right. And, you know, Clive, Clive Davis signed her, you know, like specifically like i think she he she was one of like his actual like we we need to sign her kind of things not like a and i could be i could be wrong but i think so but so you know we opened up for Mellencamp for i think two weeks or so we opened up for um the indigo girls in like this late winter of 2000 we opened up for george thorogood for a couple of weeks and we did i think i think we did like I think we did the Tonight Show, um, and we did some festival, you know, and to- like legendary, like mid-sized clubs too, like Toads. You know, I would have, yeah, right. Uh, you know, I mean, these, these clubs were like like legendary, and you know, this was all because because of Shannon, and it was it was you know my first experience at that level, um, mm-hmm. and I'm really really grateful for that because I kind of had to it was my first experience doing things where I was like, okay, this is like, this is the big deal. You know, uh, you don't, <laughs> don't mess it up. You know? Didn't uh, Jimmy Anton uh, have a broken wrist at the time or something like that? What's that? 
Didn't Jimmy Anton have a broken wrist? He he did. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I remember that. He, yeah. He was playing a little bit too far behind the B, and I was like, Jim, I just punched him. So, but you know, <laughs> right. no, J- yeah. Jimmy Anton, Jimmy Anton um had a broken wrist at for a little while, and uh his wife had a baby. <laughs> so he so he, he, he had it, he had a, he had an event going year. through it. What's that? He was going through a lot. Yeah, he was, he was going through a lot. And he, you know, and, you know, I mean, the thing is, is like you were talking about like the kind of the contrast between what is presented and what the actual experience is like right at the kind of, you know, at the beginning when we were talking and th- that tour was a, is a perfect example where it's like, I, I really am, you know, I'm, I'm, so grateful for the, all of the experiences that I had and the whole thing. But then it was also like, you know, we were, you know, we, we were doing really cool gigs, but then we were also responsible for, you know, getting, getting us to the next gig. And, you know, it, was, it, it wasn't glamorous. You know what right. I mean? Uh-huh. So sit. Good dog. Um, <laughs> I think Amazon sit. just rang the is that the the atomic dog the atomic dog yeah you got it. <laughs> <laughs> so good at least you you, yeah. you got the you got the package that's good i, I said that's it right yeah yeah <laughs> sent it so but but you know that that tour was amazing and you know my last gig with shannon was farm aid <laughs> in, wow in, you know just, in, just a little in, uh playing for tip jars right not yeah you know just it's a little kind of like, oh, it's like a picnic with, you know, 35,000 for you, <laughs> right, you know, right. and it wasn't just that gig too. It was like seeing everybody else on that gig. You know, it was, it was Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, the Bare Naked Ladies, John Mellencamp, Willie Nelson, you know, they're, you know, all these session cats who are playing with these, these artists for these one-off gigs. And it was, you know, it was, it was literally, you know, going out, going out with a bang for me. Right. Um, and yeah, I, so, and, and we got to know each other. So I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. Just, cherry, just a great cherry, experience. Yeah. Cherry on the Sunday. Right. Right. So, so before we wrap up, I got to ask you, um, you know, Dave on and Nia, before we got into professional music, he was, he was earmarked to play center field for the New York Yankees. I'm sure. Have you been keeping up on the Yankees the upcoming season? Yep. You confident? Yeah. Are, we, are, are we really going to talk about You're a Mets fan, right? Yeah, I'm a Mets fan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I tell you, I'm, I have so many strong opinions about how the Yankees have dealt players in the last two years or so. Right. That we're going to have to actually schedule another podcast. <laughs> um, I, I'll just say this. Their weakness was pitching, for sure, and and right. and injuries. Um, and I don't feel like the moves they made on the, the offseason, unless there are two triumphant comebacks, you know, with, with Corey Kluber and um, – oh, who else did they get? Paxton? No, Paxton went oh. back he, – he just got traded to the Mariners. I read that today. Oh, okay, okay. So, so Paxton, Hap, and, and Tanaka are all gone. So, right. okay. you, you know, it's, it's, you know, whether Davey Garcia will have a, you know, breakout sophomore year or whatever. So I'll just say this. I wish they would trade Gary Sanchez. I wish they would trade Araldis Chapman. And I wish they could have gotten a better pitcher than Corey Kluber. Right. So I'm surprised and, Trevor Bauer didn't, uh, they didn't pay well, money for him. Uh, well, the problem with that is like, I mean, the stuff I've read is that Trevor, Trevor and Garrett Cole don't really get along. Oh, okay. So there you go. after, after paying Garrett Cole 324 million or whatever for nine years, it's like, he kind of probably had the last, the last word on that choice. Right. So you, you never know, but I mean, also it's like, if you want to talk about like the Yankee, like Yankee pride and kind of what they stand for. It's kind of like Trevor Bauer. 
he would he would have been okay in like the late seventies Yankees. Right, right. You know where everybody was like, you know, kind of growing sideburns and mustaches, and Billy Martin was like, you know, kicking umpires and all that stuff. Yeah. But I sort of feel like they they want to stay away from the kind of like mega drama, you know, attention grabber kind of people. So I don't know, but I will say I think I I am super and. I just love good baseball. I don't care. Right. I mean, I'm a Yankee. I'm a lifer for, you know, Yankee fan for life. That's, you know, that's definitely right. done. But I tell you, I would be super, super psyched if the Mets get like one more, like if they get a, like if they pick up Jake Odorizzi or some, you know, something like that, like a decent starter who might still have some good, some life left in him, like the whole you know, Lindor move and Carrasco and the whole, it's like the Mets, the Mets are exciting right now. Yeah. Just got to stay healthy like any other team. We'll see what happens. It's, exactly. With the pitchers. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm super psyched for, um, you know, I know that they're scheduling a game, you know, an in uh, interleague game o- over September 11th. I think that's going to be a really wonderful, a, a wonderful experience to watch in every possible right, yeah. way. Oh, they're they playing out your way. What's that? Where where are they playing? Oh, they're no, playing. They're, in New York. Yeah, between the Mets and the Yankees. Oh, okay, I got you. Yeah, the the, the, the 20th anniversary of of nine eleven. So I I think that's gonna. Be, oh, okay. I didn't know that. Wow, that, that is yeah. special. Yeah, that, that's very special. Cool. I mean, I I will say this: I did go see the Yankees um, Red Sox game here in London two years ago. Oh, okay. That, they, they finally, you know, they made the move and they, they played a two game series over here, like, uh, in like late June or something. And that was in 2019. And it was awesome. Right. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. You know, I think they, they made the ball out of hard rubber because it was like 12. Each team scored six runs in the first inning. It was, you know, it was, <laughs> it was yeah. not, it was super, it was like playing PlayStation 4 or something. But right, right. it was, it was really fun to, to, have that experience here. I, I, you know, as soon as travel and safety is, you know, not an issue, then I, I'm sure they'll, they'll continue it. So we'll have so. to catch up later in the year, Dave Anania with major league baseball and music, but uh, I want to thank you brother for stopping by Joe Kelly radio in the midst of uh, hopefully heading towards the, the later stages of this pandemic. Um, Reinvent the feel, Anania, A N A N I A. Reinvent the feel, great CD. And of course, Blue Man Group, when they get back on stage, go check them out in Berlin, Germany. Please do. And Joe, man, it was so nice to spend some time with you. Thank you again for your support over the, the years that we've known each other and all of the projects I've been involved in. And um, it's always nice to hear your voice again. And I, I really appreciate you taking time out and, and having me on board. So thank you. Yeah, likewise. And we'll keep on supporting you. So look forward to what's coming ahead. And uh, we're going to listen to more music right now from Reinvent the Field. Anania. Oh. Hey, that was.